I think I speak for pretty much everyone out there that The Acolyte has been a massive success, not only in terms of story structure, character development, but also just really reaching out to the heart, the body, the mind, the penis, every part of a person's full being. No, this show's a raging dumpster fire. I refer to it as The Crapolite. I know, it's incredibly clever, the titling I've given it. And I've also gone through and broken down every single episode, heading into what will surely be the most celebrated finale in all of Star Wars history. But before we get there, I wanted to do you the service, and mainly myself the service, by making a super cut of all seven episodes leading into this one. Now, some lazier YouTube channels would just take all their videos and put them back to back to back to back to back, but not me. But not I. This is a brand new video intro. And after this... Yeah, I'm, I'm just going to be showing the old videos, but they're damn good. And you get all the information you need going into this finale of the crap light. And if you stick all the way through this thing, I might be back at the end to, to just say goodbye. How exciting would that be? All right, let us begin. And I hope to see you on the other side. Before I bust into a riveting and chilling tale of another sci-fi epic on Disney Plus, sarcasm still, I would love if you subscribe to the channel. Just go ahead and slice down that sub button. It'll be fine still. It'll be fine. But that way you won't miss any of these Star Wars breakdowns plus the countless hours of entertainment I attempt to provide you through movie reviews, criticisms, rants, roasts, and everything movies all the time. And occasionally we dip our toe into the TV. Set 100 years before the Empire rises to power, the Acolyte focuses on the Jedi and the Galactic Republic and how they've worked together in harmony and peace. But all that's about to change because there's some evil behind the scenes, working its magic, puppeteering, something sinister. And that leads us to our main antagonist who's gonna open this film up. We see a good looking younger woman who's dressed like a female grimace, walking through the rich countryside of a planet, paying off one of the locals to tell her the location of a Jedi. And that Jedi is Carrie Ann Moss, AKA Trinity. Here she's wearing the garbs, rocking that Jedi look but she's still got that Trinity magic. And since she's definitely gonna be the best thing about this, we're gonna go ahead and kill her off within the first five minutes. It's perfect. Thank you, Disney. I love what you've done with my heroes. This mysterious femme fatale gets into a Mortal Kombat-esque pose and challenges the Jedi Master to a battle, to a, a duel, I guess would be more appropriate. And cards on the table, this is the best scene out of the Acolyte so far in three episodes, hands down. It's a good action scene. It's a cool action fight. Some people argued with me when I talked about it and said, how dare you give any praise to this show? It's trash from front to back. And I disagree. I think you can still find good things and even things that suck. And right now, we have a promising start. Don't worry. It's not going to last long. After a couple solid minutes of hand-to-hand -hand combat with some nice forced trickery thrown in, saving people, stopping knives, old Trinity's going to fall for one of the dumbest tricks in the book. It's a classic, the, hey, look over there move. The assassin takes a knife and throws it at one of the dumbest aliens ever. I don't know why this guy's hanging out at the cantina still. Everyone has fled but this one dude who looks like he's still working. He's still like mixing drinks and cooking shit. <laughs> and then a knife almost hits him. Trinity stops it. But she didn't know that there was another knife heading towards her. And boom, it takes her down just like that. One knife takes her down. I saw Darth Maul somehow survive getting sliced in half. He comes back half robot, but he's still very much alive. Palpatine got launched into the cold vacuum of space. He lives to fight another day. Somehow, Palpatine returned. Even bag of bones, old Leia managed to fly back from space into a ship and seal up the hull. Why is Trinity dying from a little knife stab? Anyway, she dies, and then we cut back to the assassin who goes to retrieve one of her knives. The alien that stayed there had a kid with him. Not only is this guy an idiot, he put his children's life in danger. Well done, dude. Well done. The Crapolite title enters the frame, and then we wake with Osha in her bed. She's going to be the central protagonist here. She's a mechnic. Not a mechanic. A mechnic because everything in Disney Star Wars has to be about 50% dumber than the real world. 
Speaking of dumb, OSHA is going out into space to put out a fire that's crackling in space. Fire. The fire itself didn't really bother me. That's been established in Star Wars, and there could have been a tank that blew up that caused it. Well, I think there was actually something ruptured. But regardless, the crackling and the embers and stuff, that, that was just a bit too much. That was pretty silly. It was basically roaring up for a bunch of kids to sit around it and start roasting marshmallows. She did put out the fire, but there's a whole other set of flames being stoked right now, and that's by the Jedi Council, who is now at the ship she's working on this week, and they're looking for her. A young Jedi teen heartthrob and Dumbo start asking Osha some questions, and then immediately start doing a whole bunch of exposition about Osha's life and how her parents all died in a fire. A lot of fire going on already in this show. And I'm just sitting here thinking like, yeah, she probably remembers. It's not like she's 85 years old with a bad memory. She, she's pretty young still. This stuff all happened not that long back. Why are you telling her things? She, oh, because you're telling the audience in a really lazy way. Good job. Good right. That's just good writing. But they're not just there for nostalgia's sake. She's actually public enemy number uno. Because a Jedi died and guess what? She matches the description. They escort her into her prison cell and they're going to take her to Coruscant because there's only eight planets in all of Star Wars. So naturally Coruscant's going to be in this. A Padawan sesh, short for session, is interrupted by Master Venestra. She told her buddy Soul that his old apprentice who washed out years ago is trash. She's trash and she's killing Jedi. He's not so convinced. Speaking of Osha, she's now in a prison cell surrounded by dipshits. Fortunately for her, poor flying is going to lead to a prison break as this ship is smashing into the sides of asteroids. Osha tries to harness the force but fails. Honey, you can't, you can't force these things. <sighs> Subscribe for bad puns. A spell of good luck befalls her and she's able to get out of her cell. Unfortunately, that luck is short-lived because this ship is going right towards the planet and all the escape pods have been jettisoned leaving her to think fast. How am I gonna possibly survive a shipwreck as it's entering a foreign planet's atmosphere and is about to smash down right on the crust of it? She does the same thing any rational person would. She puts her back to a piece of junk, makes shift belts around her, and then covers her head. Listen, I cannot imagine for the life of me this working out. She's probably gonna die, and that's gonna be, oh, she lived. She crash landed on Carlac and right into our hearts. And she's not alone. There's a mysterious figure loitering around the area. She heads in pursuit. And it's revealed that the mystery woman is her sister? What? Presumed dead, her sister May is very much alive, at least in spirit. This is all a dream in her head. She's getting different visions and different communications through the power of the Force or something. Who knows? Who knows what's happening right now? It's clear that these two have a very special bond. James Bond. That doesn't make sense. They're just connected because they're twins. They were born as two, but together they're one. Or they do a bunch of nursery rhyme stuff. It's all kind of silly nonsense. But it did remind me of that awesome Spice Girl song, To Become One. Far better than anything that's happening in this Star Wars shit. The Jedi arrive on the planet and they're in pursuit of Osha. This is the lamest chase scene ever, alas, all of five seconds where they just kind of walk through a cavern and there she is at the edge of a cliff. Kind of akin to the fugitive. But, you know, without the stakes, the emotion, the drama, the intensity, anything that really makes a movie special. She's at the edge of the cliff like, I didn't kill that Jedi. Soul nods in agreement and says, I believe you, bitch. I might have added the, the last part. The episode winds down on a different planet with an ominous figure shadowed in the distance saying a bunch of stuff about acolytes and how they're the best things ever, how they don't kill with a weapon, and then he pulls out his weapon. Uh, the message is a little convoluted, it's a little confusing, but May's on board. She's like, yep, <laughs> I, I, I like this, I like where your head's at. The second episode opens on planet Olega. And here all I'm thinking is, whose Olega do I have to hump to get a good Star Wars episode around here? It's bad. Let's go on. May boss bitches herself into a restricted area. She enters a room where a Jedi is deep in meditation. After getting down into her stupid Mortal Kombat reptile pose, she demands the Jedi attack her with his full strength. 
This is a thing she keeps demanding of people and they never do it, which kind of makes her kills all the more embarrassing. It's almost like she succeeds because the people underestimate her so much because she's so unthreatening and kind of comes off as a complete joke. Not the most exciting thing to watch play out. Uh, instead, she's going to fight the air for several seconds, lose to that, and flee the scene. Hiding from the title screen. Back with Mechnek Osha. She wakes to have a chat with her old master, Soul. It is unclear at this point why she and her sister have elected to keep the same hairstyle they've had since they were children. We're going to move past it, though. There's plenty of other things to complain about. Soul learns from Ugly Gamora that May has attempted another assassination, and he and Osha have to investigate. It really makes a lot of sense to bring Osha along for the ride. She was suspect number one just like 24 hours earlier. She's a burnout Jedi who chose to stray away from the path. So yeah, of course, bring her along, have her do the investigation with him because there might be some sort of attachment between these two sisters after all. They're definitely not working together. They're not in cahoots. She could still potentially be the killer after all, but no, let, yeah, let's make her the second in command here. Instead of, I don't know, maybe not doing that because you have a bunch of other Jedi that you can use and in fact are going along as well. Scary Spice pays a visit to an old acquaintance. It's Ezra Miller, his doppelganger. I shall call him Moss Eisley Miller. Eisley Miller for short. It sounds like Ezra Miller, but it's related to Star Wars. You get it. Let's keep going. In order to kill Jedi Torben, May's gonna have to get some sort of a concoction that Isley Miller whips up in no more than five seconds. He's got all the ingredients. It's ready to go. Let's do this. Side note, I just have to say, May is probably the most unthreatening villain I've ever seen ever. She just is so cute in her purple outfit. So Disney-fied. I want to take her out and go trick-or-treating. And then head back to my place that night watch some scary movies while we check out our candy hall. That sounds wonderful. That sounds better than this. Sol and Osha have a dull conversation about being a bad teacher and a bad student. Thankfully, it's short-lived. May returns to Torben, who's still deep in Jedi meditation VR. In fact, it's now the only way he can achieve climax. She sets down the vial of mutagen she acquired, gives him an ultimatum. Hey, either come clean about what you did all those years ago with those other Jedi I'm trying to assassinate, or drink what's in the vial. It'll be over toot sweet. With the foresight that this bitch isn't going to leave him alone, and the fact that he's probably going to have to sit through a many conversation with her, he elects to kill himself. Drink the vial. The most Disney Plus sorry looking Jedi bunch I've ever seen is spying on the apothecary. That's a tough word to say, apothecary. I think that's right. Osha gets to cosplay as her sister and go undercover. Which is really easy to do, it turns out, when you look identical and still retain the same hairstyle. It's almost too easy. All she had to do was throw some purple garbs over her and... She's ready to go. Isley Miller, believe it or not, isn't fooled by one of the worst performances ever. This is terrible, Osha. You suck at acting. Thankfully, the Jedi are right outside the door. They pop in and grill Isla for answers. <laughs> and he flips on May incredibly fast. They don't have to do anything. He's like, okay, I'll, I'll tell you everything you need to know before they really even ask a question. It's, it's pretty pathetic. They find out she's heading back there that night to get further supplies because every good assassin knows you continuously go back to the scenes of the crime. You keep showing yourself in the town that you just did murder in. It's brilliant. All right, we have a big confrontation between Master Soul and Mei, who's surprised to see him. She's like, what? There's Jedi here patrolling the streets after I just killed a Jedi? What are the odds? And they have an epic showdown where she tries to kill him with her dumbass knives. But he throws those lame things aside and they do a cool little fight. It's decent. It's decent. And at this point in Star Wars, all I'm looking for is decent. Because everything good is gone. Thanks, Disney. I love what you did to my heroes. Again, zero threat coming from May. She does some spins, a twist, and a kiss. Sol looks bored almost to be there. He's throwing her aside. He's like, are we really doing this right now? This is pathetic. While this is happening, Osha's in a hallway listening in. There's a poor edit here. I gotta point it out. She's on the little intercom thing, whatever that dumb little toy that they're trying to sell is. There's a person in the background walking towards her. Camera does a cut, cuts back, 
woman's gone, disappears out of thin air, only to reappear down the hallway, NPC walking through again. What is going on? May is now surrounded. How in the fuck is she going to get out of this one? Well, she knows a Jedi's true weakness is sand. She huffs and she puffs and she blows the Jedi's house down, disappearing into the puffs of sand that appear. It was almost too easy. Seriously, it was almost too easy. Ah, sand! Ugh, ugh. Is she using super speed to get away? No, nah, she's just kind of jogging over there. Yeah, I would get her, but ugh, ah, sand. Ugh, yuck, I hate it. It gets everywhere. Finally, we get our first sister, sister confrontation as Tia and Tamara lock eyes with one another. Hot. Sexy hot. Much like me in Fortnite, Osha cannot hit shit and May gets away. That's a shame. Soul gets scolded by Martian Manhunter because he botched this entire mission. And might I just point out that the Jedi are just idiots. If you know, pretty much without a shadow of a doubt, that this character that's going around killing off your own members is going to be at an exact location that night, why not pull down the full force of the Jedi Nye? Why not pull down 10% of the force? 5%, maybe even two? Instead, they elect to just keep the four schlubs that are there working? Surround the area, make a perimeter, get ships right outside the planet so that she can't leave. This isn't complicated. We have established that there's been peace and a harmony for hundreds of years now. Put up a barricade. Jesus Christ, what in the world? Anyway, May gets away. <laughs> the episode winds down with two space hobos on another planet coming into contact with a Wookiee. Who knows the Force? Why not? Sure, everybody, everybody knows the Force at this point. The Force is furry. His name is Kanaka, and I believe he knows Osha and May. I'm sure he'll have a pivotal role later in this show. <laughs> Can't wait for this to be over. And that's the episode. I'm going to go over this thing from a chronological standpoint. So let's begin 16 years earlier, where we get a flashback of the twin girls frolicking in the woods in a restricted area, I suppose, trying to use some magical witch force powers to move a CG butterfly thing around. The coven of women in this episode don't refer to the force as the force because I, I don't know, patriarchy or something. That <laughs> they, they, they just refer to it as like a magical thread, an entity, something that they can manipulate and use. May and Osha get in a bit of a tiff as they're going to do throughout this episode about whether or not it's good to mess with creatures using these abilities and whatnot. And then they're going to go into town where they see their mothers, plural. Yeah, so brave, so bold. There is talk in the town of some spice cream that you can purchase. The girls are very excited about getting their hands on some spice cream. And the writer was so proud of coming up with this idea of taking ice cream, a nice tasty cold treat, and marrying it together with spice, a magical element that's been in Star Wars for a long time. Dune, of course, has spice as well. But here we are with spice cream. What a fun idea. They say it four or five times throughout the episode. At one point, the girl, I think it's uh, Osha, she's going to get four spice creams. <laughs> Careful, the tummy's not going to agree with that. Too much spice in your diet's going to have you go into the bathroom lickety split. Sure hope you're good with the force, girls, because you're going to be doing a lot of force pushing on the toilet. As an aside, the first two episodes of this show were perfectly average, borderline mediocre at best, with a couple cool action sequences. I thought they were cool. It's subjective, of course. Some people said they're terrible. Everything's terrible all the time. I like to be a little optimistic. But this episode, I mean, it's it plays out like a Mary-Kate and Ashley movie from the 90s. Just pure kitty garbage across the board. And I say this with respect to my viewers, but if you are liking this show, if you like this episode, that's perfectly fine. But it is clear to me now that this is aimed at children, at little children, babies, basically. That, that's the level on display, Mary-Kate and Ashley style stuff. If you like that, that's cool. There's some stuff I like that's aimed at that age too, and that's fine. It's fair. Spy Kids. I like Spy Kids. That was a that was a fun movie. 
haven't seen it in a long time, but you know, whatever. One of the moms, Mother Coral, I don't actually know the other one's name, the one that gave birth to these kids, as we're gonna find out later. She looks like a female albino Darth Maul with the horns coming out of the face and everything, the tattoos. But Mother Coral is gonna teach these girls how to do a training sesh, short for session, where she's going to not force push, she's gonna, I don't know, spiritually push, female witch push, a couple of ladies. And this is what they consider an exciting, riveting training session. This phrase keeps getting used too, where it's not the power of one or the power of two, but the power of many. And, she, <laughs> okay. Meaning we are stronger as a unit, ladies. The force is female after all. This is such a terrible scene. There is no pageantry at all. When she uses the force, she's just going And they put lame background sound effects over it. There's no wind in the room. The pebbles aren't moving on the ground. Hair is not blowing. There isn't even a flicker of a candlelight. It's just them making silly little poses with some sound effects. It gets worse. We are now treated to the Mortal Kombat Ascension scene in the film where these two girls, Osha and Mei, their life so far has led up to this, where they're going to ascend and become witches. The coronation, convinced of an all-female coven, of course, they are having seizures, they're doing chanting, one woman's yelping like a bird call or something. <laughs> They are having the time of their life. It's this spiritual orgasmic celebration of ascension. And I assume for many of them, it's the only way they can achieve climax. Mother Coral starts doing a sing-songy chant. It's weird, it's uncomfortable. Again, singing about the, the power of one, the power of two. The power of one, the power of two, the power of many. It reminded me of going to Catholic Mass back in the day where the priest would do this same thing. Let us proclaim the mystery of faith. It's weird. Either sing or talk. Pick a lane. Osha's all in. She's ready to accept this privilege, but may? Not so much. Maybe not, she's thinking. And she eventually does give in, but too little too late. Before they can officially kind of do the spiritual touch, the stupid Jedi interfere and show up. At least Trinity's back. And she's going to do absolutely nothing in this episode, so. Great, thanks. Thanks for that. She and her posse roll up and they want to talk to the two girls. They also want to speak to the father which is an insulting, borderline disgusting thing to ask a coven of witches. They, uh, they're not a fan of it. One says, yeah, there is no dad. We don't need no man to make kids. They quickly move on from this point, which was a little odd not to follow up with further questions. We then learn a little bit later during a conversation with the moms that these two girls were made using magic, apparently. Let's jump in the Wayback Machine, go to the early aughts when Star Wars Episode One hit, and that dumbass plot point was revealed that Anakin Skywalker was made using midichlorians and immaculate conception. His mom never had a husband, never had a guy. Not a hit it and quit it situation, go out for milk, never come back. No, the Force hit it and quit it. Went out for spice cream and never came back. And so Anakin's just this prodigal child it was so dumb, but I'm not a fan of the prequels, just full stop. But that plot point specifically made me roll my eyes hard. The Force was always fun because it was this kind of like mysterious, ominous thing. You didn't really know how people got the abilities, where it came from. That's what made it interesting and cool. Getting it down to a science where there's these midichlorians, these little microscopic things in the air that can, I guess, get into people's systems and make them Jedis, that's weird and dumb and I don't like it at all. What's been alluded here is that these mothers were in a laboratory mixing and mashing spices and herbs and plants and midichlorians together before they accidentally added the secret ingredient, chromosome X. Hence, these two beautiful girls were birthed. It's dumb. 
OSHA 11 goes with the Jedi on their ship, takes a little picture test, and she nails it. Nobody's seen a better test result than what OSHA did. She got them all right on the first try. Person, woman, man, camera, TV, it was nothing for her. No one's ever seen anything like it. And OSHA wants to be a Jedi. Mother Coral says, fine, fuck off, go for it. <laughs> You're dead to me. OSHA barely even bats an eye at the fact that she's not going to see these people ever again. I guess I can't blame them based on the orgy they had a little bit earlier during the coronation. And also, lightsabers are pretty cool. I gotta admit, lightsabers are cool, and that's enough for me right there. I'll bounce for my family tomorrow. I'll bounce for my family right now if a Jedi shows up, says, Hey, here's a lightsaber. You want to train in the forest? You want to be able to move shit with your mind? <laughs> yeah. Bye, kids. Before Osha can pack up and bounce, though, stupid sister May comes by her room and says, Not leaving. Not on my watch, sister. T and Tamara get into a struggle before May takes out a sci-fi torch, drops it on the ground, setting the whole place ablaze. And by whole place, I mean the whole place. The entire mountainside complex goes up in flames in the matter of seconds. The editing here... Holy shit, it's bad. What happened? We go from May dropping a candelabra to the entire place burning up, people dead all over. It looks like all the witches died. We don't see any of them die. We don't see any of it happen, which makes me think that this is a misdirect. That later on, we're going to go back and find out, oh, there was actually some bad Jedi that killed these people because they knew the witches weren't going to let May, they weren't going to let Osha go train, or they had a disturbance in the forest and they see some bad in them, so they have to do what has to be done. There's got to be more going on. Or maybe it's the evil force that's going on, the Sith side, that set this whole thing up. Either way, it's a mess. But I'm willing, I'm willing to lay off criticism in this department because it seems so obviously done on purpose there's no way they edited the way they did and said yep this is great this is perfect going from a shot of me dropping this candle thing the sci-fi thing to the whole place is in flames bodies are all over the ground the moms are dead unceremoniously not a chance I refuse to believe even this show on Disney Plus is that stupid. They're telling us the entire coven is taken out by what is essentially the equivalent of a Star Wars Bath and Body Works candle. Osha ends up with the Jedi, and May is left alone. Hmm. It's powerful stuff. For a four-year-old. Easily one of the dumbest episodes of a Star Wars show I've ever seen. Full stop, not even a competition. What a waste of time, what a waste of talent and energy. Our story opens on Kofar, home to the Jedi Wookiee Master Kalnaka. Kalnaka! And I'm Kalnaka gonna lie to you, the guy's made a pretty nice home for himself here. He's got the trees, he's got the plants, and he's fixing himself a nice plate for dinner, but the camera's more fixated on what's happening on the walls next to him. There's some nice prints, some beautiful artwork, some swirls, some patterns. It's another mystery that I really don't care if they solve or not. Back at Crescent Roll, Jedi training commences. And Osha's on her way out, she packed her bags, she's headed for the door, She's going to opt out saying goodbye to Master Soul because, let's, let's be honest, he's boring. She doesn't have time for that crap. And I think she feels bad for, you know, just being an all-around trash bag of a person. Meanwhile, May and Star Wars budget Ezra Miller are tracking that Wookiee Master. And by the way, this episode is flipping back and forth between these two stories constantly. So just try to keep up with me. I'm having a hard time keeping up with myself. It's a whirlwind. <laughs> oh. Kill me. Master Soul converses with his fellow Jedi comrades. There's Penis Head, Martian Manhater, and my favorite, Regular Lady in a Cloak, plus a few other idiots just to kind of mix things up a bit. They have all determined in their infinite wisdom that they need to figure out who was training May. Who is this mysterious ringleader behind the curtain, this Wizard of Oz? It feels like I'm just padding this video out right now. Because I am, let's keep going. Soul, not one to ever take a hint, starts chasing after May because he wants her to go on this Scooby-Doo adventure with him, believing the only way to really get a reach on May is through the love of a sister because he believes there's still some good in her. I'd like to think that's true. Some weird muskrat thingy gets shot in the face by what I imagine is Osha's vibrator. Probably humorous for someone out there. I, I don't know who, but uh, 
It's, it's got to be funny for someone, right? Why else would they have made this? And why would they have designed that complete monstrosity of a character unless they thought it was cute or funny to someone out there? The gang's all here. We finally are all touched down on Kofar looking for this tricky Wookiee. Jedi Master Zoolander is not impressed that Osha has a blaster in her possession. Short for possession. But before he can confiscate it, Soul senses a presence in the woods. And woodsn't you know it. It's from the Wookiee. That was a stretch of a pun. Woodsn't you know it. It was it's sloppy. It's just sloppy. Osha, unable to resist, touches a tree's giant ball sack. And now this is the only way I can achieve climax. Uh-oh, it looks like we're gonna get a huge action sequence. Disturbing that sack disturbed some of the bugs in the area. Well, singular, a bug, a, a single bug, attacks the crew. What are we gonna do in this situation? Master Soul steps in, showcasing the sheer brute strength and skill of a Jedi warrior, busting out the saber, ready to attack, getting in formation, and slices down the creature. Oh, what else is there's gonna be a whole bunch of them gonna come out now, right? We're gonna have this cool, and it's done. The scene's done. Single bug slice and done. You would think based on the recovery of this moment that Master Soul just got done fighting off 17 waves of these things. He's pretty out of breath here. <sighs> you see what I did back there? Did, did you guys catch that? I cut that bug in half with the sword. What he just did right there at one point I thought would be the Jedi equivalent of just smacking a bug with a fly swatter. But apparently that was way more intense than I gave it credit for. Because he's he's in rough shape after that little <laughs> after that little moment. <sighs> Whew, whoa, that was uh, I might have to sit down from this. Whew. Back with me. She opens up to her buddy Mose Isley Miller and says how this is more than just training for her to appease her master. It's actually her final mission. What comes next is anyone's guess. But if she doesn't complete the task at hand. She's going to be killed by the master. Mm, powerful stuff. We are about 20 minutes deep into episode four and really nothing has happened at all. Definitely feels the most padded out. Feels like the most filler of the bunch. A lot of repeated dialogue. A lot of scenes that really don't need to exist at all. They're not pushing the story in any sort of direction, front or back or sideways. Just, just nothing of consequence happening. A lot of running in place with an occasional animal or a trap springing. Speaking of which... Peekaboo. Isley Miller gets hung out to dry because May decided, wait, you know what? I don't even need to do this. I'm really glad we had this talk and I was able to kind of work through some shit. My sister's alive. I don't care about this crazy Sith Lord or whatever's going on behind the scenes. I have my sister back. Thanks, Isley Miller. See you never. And he's like, you're just gonna leave me here? And she's like, yeah, bye. She literally left him hanging. Rocket Raccoon's slow cousin spots May and calls out to the Jedi. But May, no longer a killer, just wanted to do a meet and greet with the Wookiee, possibly get an autograph and a selfie. Only to find out someone did her old job for her as he's already been murdered. For those keeping track, this edgy adult show about a Jedi assassin going after these masters and killing them has so far had one fight that led to a death, one poisoning where the guy offed himself, and one where the Jedi was killed off camera. Wow. Really, really riveting entertaining stuff here. May is in big trouble. She's cornered by all of these Jedi and there's no sand in sight to save her this time. What is she gonna puff up in the air to run away? I have a feeling it's gonna be hard for her to get out of this one. I think this time there's not gonna be some convenient little thing that shows, oh, and something showed up. Frozen in place due to either fear or laughing to herself because of how stupid this dude looks, a mysterious entity shows up, gets right up in her grill, and is rocking one of those kick-ass Sith sabers. That red is hot. It's fiery hot. The Jedi do not hesitate. <laughs> <laughs> the lightsabers spring into action. They rush forward to Osha's aid. The evil villain tosses her aside like a rag doll and whoosh, 
throws them all backwards right at the camera. This surely will not be the last of this battle. No, 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 no. We are gearing up for the most epic fight in Star Wars history. Yes, so far, 30 minutes of my time have been wasted. Life I will not get back. It's precious. We have one chance here on Earth. Let's make the most of it and not waste it on the Acolyte. But I did. That time cannot be retained. It cannot be brought back. I don't have a Harry Potter time turner or some shit. No, I'm in now. I'm invested. And thank Thankfully, it's all led to a cool fight scene at the end of this episode. The tease, the build, it's here. Yes, we went on this waste of fucking time adventure quest so far that led to nothing, but bam, we have a Sith reveal. We have Jedi with all the power in the world coming head to head, and the episode's over. The episode is over. The credits have kicked in. Are you out of your fucking mind with this crap? Episode 4. Complete trash. Nothing happens. Oh, May has a change of heart suddenly. She has a change of fart because her sister is alive. And she had to go to a different planet and realize, you know what? I don't need to be doing this. This is so stupid. It's so childish. And yeah, I know it's a show about guys with light swords stabbing at each other. Or at least it used to be. They don't even do that anymore. Now they just get flung around and it's over. Hell, no one in this show that's comprised mainly of Jedi has used a fucking lightsaber in battle yet. Sure, they busted it out a couple times, but nothing of real substance has been done with them. One time they used it to light up a cavern. Maybe, maybe they used it as a glorified bug zapper. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> ah, I forgot to I forgot to put it hey I didn't retract it ah, that's gonna hurt that's gonna hurt owie it's a good thing it wasn't a small little knife where I'd be dead right now instead of just impaling myself through the gut it costs a fortune like 180 million dollars I think I read 180 million dollars where's that at where's that where's that money being used certainly not in the choreography Certainly not in the big action spectacle. This is Star Wars, but it's coming off like this little tiny kitty crap. I, I, I just, I'm blown away by how boring this is. What a tedious ad fucking adventure. The last episode, horrible, embarrassingly bad, but at least it was fun to make fun of. It had so much cringe built in. It had so many ridiculous conversations and setups. This is just boring. This is just a slog. And then when they finally have the opportunity, like we saw in the teaser, to have this kick-ass fight, they squander it. They, they throw it in our face like it's nothing. Now, it's poss, short, uh, short for possible, that we will get something epic in episode five. Maybe this fight does go for an extent. Maybe it's the whole episode. It's like a, a Dragon Ball Z thing where they spend 30 minutes powering up for a legendary battle. But it's not like we spent 30 minutes here powering up. No, this was thrown in right at the end. It's just so half-assed and lazy. I'm sick of it. But we're going to continue because people like the pain. People like the misery. We revel in it together. And it's all we have anymore. All these other characters have been either... Uh, like killed off or sunsetted in the most insulting ways possible. And I'm not even just talking about Star Wars. Uh, yes, of course, Luke handled like absolute shit. Even Han Solo kind of disrespected. But but Indiana Jones, 85 years old, like schlubbing around in a, <laughs> in a tank top. It's so bad. It's so bad. Jurassic Park, Jurassic World, 18. They bring back all the old crew for one last dinosaur ride. No one wants to see this. Maybe we say we want to, but it's just, it, it's embarrassing. Having them put on their iconic jackets and they're, they're limping around, barely able to walk one foot in front of the other. I can't with this crap, make something new. And if you're gonna do the same thing over, at least make it exciting, make it fun. This is just a sleeper. It's a slog. All right, I could keep going, but uh, I'm just an old man yelling in the sky right now. I, I just can't believe what a waste of time this is. Last week, we left off with OSHA's Eleven getting absolutely bodied by Darth Gimp. 
And this week promises to have what will surely be the greatest lightsaber battle of all time ever. And wouldn't you know it, this episode fires up on all cylinders, with Osha popping up from the ground for the 50th time. Seriously, we're only five episodes deep. I've seen Osha spazzily sit up from sleep, I don't even know, countless times at this point. It's getting absurd. She trips over her own stupidity next to a fallen Jedi. And off yonder, we see what is either a rave happening in the woods or a good old fashioned Jedi throwdown. She investigates. Gimp Vader takes a slice out of Master Zoolander right before making short work of a couple other Jedi dipshits. Orca shoots a whale sonar at him. It surprisingly does nothing. Meanwhile, Maya ransacks dead budget Chewbacca's place, finding his trusty saber. Squid Games enters the arena. And just before something interesting happens, there's that trusty title card to ruin it all. Every time something great's gonna happen in this show, which is rare, but... On occasion it happens, it is always ruined by a cutaway to something else. And this happens constantly in this episode. And to this episode's credit, it's easily the most entertaining of the five so far because there's a lot of duels going on. And there are some pretty slick moments. I'm not gonna pretend that there's not. I'm not gonna be one of those people that just rages and hates on everything. There were genuinely some cool moments, some small moments in a empty shell of a show. And when you have a budget of $180 million, I would sure as shit hope so. Master Zoolander is going to escort Osha back to the ship so Squid Game can take care of business. Soul says to the Gimp, you carry a Jedi weapon, but you are no Jedi. I like that. Pump the brakes. We got a good old fashioned cat fight. And then the cat fight. Jedi face paint fights Maya. There are back and forth duels taking place. The camera has ADD, doesn't know who to focus on. Got these Jedi fights going back to back. We going back to back. These fights last for 10 seconds. There's a couple flourishes, some swirls, some twists with a kiss, and then they're undercut with dialogue. They're so short lived and we cannot focus on one thing to get invested in what's happening. I'm not even sure why Maya's fighting to begin with. It sounded like she was gonna join the cause, be with her sister, but maybe she just wants her sister and not the Jedi. Either way, I've lost all interest in that storyline. Finger Paints appears to be a worthy fighter. Busting out some very impressive swordplay. In fact, she has the best choreography of the bunch. Props to the actress. I mean, I feel nothing, but I'm sure there's someone out there that really is eating this up. There's that one person out there that's just all in. You know what it is? It's the music and how unremarkable it is. This is a franchise that's been pinned with some of the best music in the business. Such iconic scores. And here, it just feels like an afterthought, just kind of like subtly in the background. Where's the duel of the face? Where's that? It's just very like... I don't like it. I don't care about it. I mean, it's that and the fact that all joy has left my body years ago. And all that's left is a used up husk of a man. And the word man is doing a lot of heavy lifting here, considering I'm wearing a Wolverine t-shirt surrounded by a bunch of memorabilia and nostalgia. Let's continue. We have a pretty slick kill here, plus a villain reveal. Bob Ross face gets three hole punched to death. She died admirably by Mos Eisley Miller. That's right, Ezra Miller at home is actually Gimp Vader. And I guess he was another ex-Padawan or ex-Jedi. I, I don't know, they know him, they know this clown. But why male models? Asks Master Zoolander before getting his neck snapped. K.O. Soul gets the best shot in the film, walking like a baller towards the camera. Vroom, force pulls his saber up without even looking. He no-scopes it. It's awesome. I loved it. And he makes short work of Isley Miller, but he stopped just before decapitation. Short for decapitation. <clears throat> Osha motherly interrupts Squid Game right before he's about to finish the task. Because of all the dumb Jedi rules that have been infused in this society for many a year, he is unable to kill him because he's unarmed. You can't, you can't take down an unarmed foe or some dumb logical bullshit. So using a loophole, she kisses her pet robot friend goodbye, says, I love you, little robot, and then chucks it at the back of Mose Eisley Miller. It starts lighting up, which I guess is different than all the lightsabers that were lighting up, because this calls upon the bug bat creatures. They start taking him out. I'm sorry, what? How is this any different than just straight up killing him with the lightsaber? 
you're killing him either way. It's just this whole cheat code where you're not directly doing it. You're indirectly killing him. It's so stupid and even more dumb. These two idiots watch as Isley Miller gets lifted off the ground as he's cutting down the bat bugs and they pull him away. Yeah! And they just casually watch and then forget about it instantly. Well, that just happened. So how are things? It's so ridiculous. They don't even track him down. They don't know if he's dead or not. It's just, eh, it's, he's off camera now. So we can't, he, he stage exited left. We can't follow anymore. <laughs> Shenanigans. I'm also going to go out on a limb here and say he's not the main villain. He's an apprentice and the main villain is, of course, a strong female lead. And for Disney Star Wars... It's about time. You just know it is. And there was some really ham-fisted on-the-nose dialogue earlier from, I don't know if it was Osha or Maya or Mia, Mama Mia. It doesn't matter. One of them said that the mother has the power to do some cool trickery using the Jedi Force, or I guess they call it threads or yarn or some sort of Joanne Fabric equivalent. And so, yeah, she's obviously going to be the one in charge. She's going to be the, uh, the master here. The Sorceress Supreme. The Taco Supreme. <laughs> I don't know what I'm saying anymore. Let's keep going. Ocean Spray is troubled by something Gimp Vader said before he was lifted out of the scene. And it's that she shouldn't trust these guys, especially Master Soul. But before Soul can say anything, he's blasted by that same sonar that did nothing earlier to the Gimp. It definitely affected Soul, even though Soul appears to be stronger and better at fighting in the Force. Here, how do none of these dumbass Jedi not sense anything happening around them. They don't know when a threat is there. They don't know where this master Sith thing hovers down. There was like a baker's dozen of these Jedi. None of them felt the disturbance. All right, he's knocked out. T and Tamara have a loving embrace. Looks like they're gonna be sister sister after all. Girls get it done sort of thing, but nope, we got another double cross. Osha cannot let Maya get away with her bad deeds, her dirty deeds done dirt cheap. She's going to turn her in. But then nope again. Maya gets the upper hand, takes out her sister with a, like a little baby force push, and it knocks her out. And in Maya's infinite wisdom, she remembers watching Alien Coven shit, that terrible alien movie. And at the end of that film, the robot cuts his hair so he can look like the other version of himself, his twin. And that's what she does. She gets down in the dumbest pose I think I've ever seen ever in anything. Looks like a complete fucking idiot. Cuts up on her hair. There's so much pageantry with this woman. Who's she trying to impress in this sequence? No one's going to cut their hair like this. Let me get down in this almost sexualized pose. I look really cool doing this. And, vroom, and now this is the only way I can achieve climax. Again, we've established the Jedi are dumb as a box of rocks. No one's going to be any of the wiser that she's traded places. No one's going to be any of the wiser that she just pulled a parent trap. Actually, the Star Wars equivalent of Niffler knows what's going on. His nose doesn't lie. What an absolutely disgusting abomination of a character. That thing is fugly beyond all belief. Shocker! Gimp Vader lives! They really had me going for a second. I thought for sure those bug bat things had the best of him, considering we just saw him go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a bunch of Jedi Masters and survive pretty much unscathed. But yeah, this is going to be what takes him out, is what I thought. This is going to be the end of him. Osha meets up with Soul. Uh, I'm going to take a shot in the dark that that's actually Maya. Uh, I, I think that's it's supposed to be obvious. If it's not, it, it sure as hell is coming off that way. And the episode winds down with the Gimp finding Osha on the ground, who he assumes is Maya. Maybe it's Maya. Maybe it's Maybelline. Who knows anymore? We'll find out next week, I'm sure. He utters a bunch of nonsense that I had to rewind three times because he talks like he has several dicks in his mouth. He's like, mm -hmm. spoiler, it wasn't worth rewinding. It's, it's completely nothing. And that's what this show is to me. And that's why I continue to watch because I'm a sucker for misery. All right, those are my thoughts. That's the spoiler breakdown in episode five of The Crapolite. It was better than the last couple episodes, but that means very little at this point. Who knows where things go next week? Maybe we get a manicure using the lightsaber. <laughs> Maybe we get to see a full-blown wax with the lightsaber. <laughs> Only time will tell.
and some of these mysteries will be revealed. We start this riveting episode with Osha awaking from her slumber. If that sounds awfully familiar, that's because it's both awful and familiar. There have been like eight scenes that start this way. The Force is female? Nah. The Force is falling asleep. We find these two gals in a parent trap situation of sorts. Mei's pretending to be her sister Osha, off with Master Soul. Meanwhile, we have Osha stranded on an unknown planet. Literally called Unknown Planet. But each scene of this episode is about 30 seconds long. We don't have time to waste. We're back on Kofar. And the gang's all here. Actually, most of the gang is dead. <laughs> Those that are alive are abandoning the planet. They're taken off. Master Squid Game informs a hologram that most of the Jedi died during this little confrontation. Short for confrontation. He's heading back home. May, in disguise as Osha, heads up to the deck to assassinate Master Soul. Good thing he's a Jedi and he can sense this stuff. He can sense danger a mile away. I've seen Jedi sense thing planets away, galaxies away. So obviously any threat that's right behind him is going to be recognized instantaneously. There's no way he's going to miss a beat with this. And of course he doesn't know she's coming. He is completely in the weeds on this. The Jedi in this show are absolute trash bags. They're really giving the prequel Jedi a run for their money. Okay, what we have here, my friends, is what I assume is a rejected character from the Star Wars Holiday Special, trying to puzzle together whether or not this Osha is actually Osha at all. Back on the unknown planet, budget Ezra Miller goes for a dip. Pops the T, pops the P, he's going all in. Sun's out, bun's out. And Osha's into it. Now, she wants to kill him. As an aside, this actress is looking damn good in that outfit. It's like the equivalent of Star Wars Nike attire. It's very sporty, looks very comfortable. I can see the slogan now, Nike's the acolyte. Just don't do it. These two have a bit of a chat. And Osha decides not to fire at him after all. He informs Osha that he didn't in fact kill two people that she kind of liked, so she decides to spare him. She's not going to go at him. Meanwhile, fake Osha docks a ship into its butt plug and then receives an unexpected hug from a grieving Jedi. Meanwhile, Martian Manhater is having a conversation with what seems to be the human equivalent of Beavis or Butthead. I can't decide where to fall on this thing. He informs her of the Jedi's failure on Kofar. Osha and Mose Eisley Miller continue their chat. He is incredibly chillaxed. He informs her that any point she can dip out. There's a plane off yonder. It's gonna take a day's swim to get there, so you better go now before sunset. And then, yeah, you can you can leave the planet. They kind of give me an odd angle, though, when he says that this is a good swim out, because from the vantage point I'm getting here, it looks like it's just over a couple wave crests. Really no more than uh, a five-minute swim. I'm pretty sure I could pick a pebble up and toss it hitting the plane from the beach. Hell, Bob Hope could jump that distance in his golf cart. Road trip reference. Subscribe. She takes a look. But then she weighs the pros and the cons. The cons being she's not going to eat for a while and she has a rumbly in her tumbly. So she's going to head with Mose Eisley Miller see what he's got cooking up for dinner. Rocket Raccoon's inbred cousin is either attempting to attack fake Osha right now or dry hump her into oblivion. In either case, it's now the only way I can achieve climax. And he didn't even buy her dinner first. He fails, but she does receive something out of the deal. Her sister's Game Boy Advanced. Isley Miller is making some toilet wine as he talks about how stupid the Jedi are. This is one thing we truly agree on. She turns down the porridge, but I have a feeling he's going to win over Goldilocks before this is all said and done. He needs to find the porridge that's just right. Before she leaves, though, he reminds her she has unfinished business. He wants her to penetrate him with her saber before she goes. And I realize how that sounded. Osha gets pissed, which is really hard to tell because her expression remains the same no matter what emotion she's feeling. Martian Manhater is once again chatting with Beavis and or Butthead. This scene lasts for all of five seconds. May, who is barely even trying to play her sister, manages to continue tricking Soul. Yes, he's grieving, but you're a Jedi for fuck's sake. Have some dignity. Finally, Master Squid Game comes to his senses. He takes May from behind. I mean, he stuns her with his blaster. That, that came out wrong again. This all happens in front of that ugly CG abortion of a creature creation. Oh my god, we have some more time with Beavis and Butthead. Isley Miller is fixing up his gimp mask while Osha takes a nice peek at his uh, tramp stamp. Hot. Sexy. 
He wants her to try on his helmet because it can block lightsaber attacks and really let her concentrate on the force. And I'm sorry, but it's happening. I'm officially shipping these two. Do people still say shipping? Stupid phrase to begin with, but uh... Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm shipping them. Now back on Kofar, because 20 seconds have gone by, the Jedi are doing a field trip of their dead friends. Oh no, another bug thing is coming! Those were threatening never. Luckily for them, Martian Manhater has her trusty purple lightsaber whip. And she no-scopes it, winds it back up, and puts it away. This is a weapon that only she possesses and will never show up again in the franchise. Good. That's good. I love that consistency. Thank you, Disney. I love what you've done with my franchise! Truth be told, that doesn't bother me at all. <laughs> like, if you want to have a bunch of crazy weaponry and stuff, great, cool. Just make it look fun and interesting and engaging and, well, no, we're not doing any of that either. That's the problem. Whew. Has it been 30 seconds already? Back on Unknown Planet, OSHA's trying on the GIMP mask. Wow, it took all of a afternoon of convincing to get her to put on a Sith mask. I will say though, she looks pretty damn awesome in it. That is a sweet looking helmet. Hot damn, I'm joking. That's the dumbest fucking thing I've ever seen. And thankfully, that's the end of the episode. She's going to the dark side. Tune in next week, friends, when May decides to fight with the Jedi instead of against them. As Osha continues her fall into darkness, the sisters have switched sides fully. It is a Freaky Friday situation. It is parent trap. But I have a feeling that when this thing winds down, these two are going to reject where they ended up and they're going to come together once more, forming a new type of Jedi or Sith. Something new, something gray. Maybe a Jith or a Sedai. I'm workshopping these ideas, okay? I'm working here! We open on Brendok, 16 years earlier. Master Soul is seen collecting a sick batch of weed for the Great Harvest. Trinity and Budget Chewbacca are scanning the area for silver doubloons. They've been collecting them. You gotta get them all. You gotta catch them all. I don't actually know what they're doing. They're, they're, I guess they're, they're searching for, for spice. <laughs> they're, <laughs> they're searching for force radiation. Skew. Skew. They're actually here in search of a great virgence, which is a mass of force collected together. And with that great power comes great responsibility. Well, not, no, with that great power comes the ability to create new life. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. No cap. They decide, in their infinite wisdom, to split up. That way they can cover more ground. This always pans out for the heroes when they split up. Nothing ever goes wrong. Soul discovers T and Tamara's play place. Sister, sister. He witnesses them do their patty cake ring around the forcey dance just before female Darth Maul interrupts. Soul attempts to reach the rest of his team. No time to wait around. He's going to follow them. Thinking fast with Jedi knowledge on his side, he attempts to break into the compound by just pushing the little digital tablet interface they have out front. Alas, his crafty sense did not work, and instead he's going to scale the old-fashioned way. He witnesses a force-pushing session. Remember, they don't call it the force. They call it uh, the thread or the string or some Joanne Fabrics equivalent. I can't remember what it's called. And really, this entire episode is nothing more than a greatest hits collection of a previous episode. The worst episode of the season, as a matter of fact. We get to relive through the eyes of different characters events that we've already seen. Told terribly the first time around, and now we get to relive this hellish nightmare. Sol gets back to his team, explains how there's a witch in Coven here, and they have a couple of girls they're planning on preparing a ceremony for. He is troubled by this. He's worried for their well-being. They're in pursuit, heading through a hallway that genuinely looks like they're in a queue to go on a ride at Walt Disney World. Uh, I can't wait for this new Star Wars ride to open up. Not much longer now. Mother Witch enters young Torben's mind. And she's kind of being a bit sexual about it, caressing his chest, whispering sweet nothings into his ear. And now this is the only way I can achieve climax. Torben ends up giving in to Agatha all along, and she releases him. And probably not in the way he was hoping she would. She's interrupted by her stupid bratty kid who wants to go with the Jedi. The next morning, we see Torben in deep meditation, probably trying to hack back into that Only Force account. Alas, he fails. 
It's testing time. And yes, Trinity, you are experiencing deja vu because we've all seen this already. They start talking about Ascension, what it means to the witches and how Osha and May are definitely a big part of this. Soul's not an idiot in this instance. And he understands that May threw the test, but they don't have time to dwell on it. They're gonna test Osha next. And she passes with flying colors. Unfortunately, it was all for naught because the Jedi Council has determined it's bad to separate these two girls. And I agree. I think that that's just this disgusting thing to do, especially when you barely know these people. What, what, what the hell's going on here? Master Squid Games is pissed though. After doing some further testing, they determine these girls aren't just identical twins looks wise, even though they are not identical twins look wise, they're played by two completely different actresses. They are also chemically identical. Their DNA is the same. Their midichlorian count, they don't mention that, but they do say they're symbiotes. Their symbiotes are the same. Clearly this means they were created by the virgins. Torben is super jazzed about this. This means he can get off this God's forsaken planet, head back home as long as he can grab the girls and prove it. So he takes off in a speeder. <laughs> this kid's incorrigible. <laughs> Agatha all along talks to the other witches about Osha's determination to leave. Meanwhile, Darth Mom and May have other plans. They have decided they're gonna stop this from happening by any means necessary. Keep in mind, we are re-watching 20 to 30% of this episode over again. What a treat. How fun. <sighs> May once again throws the Bed Bath & Beyond Star Wars candelabra to the ground and the place goes up in flame. This time, thankfully, we do get an explanation as to how this huge fire actually happened. There's no way this thing took off after hitting stone walls and a stone floor. I mean, the whole place is made out of freaking rock and concrete and yeah no that's what happened that's how it that's how it started the fire took off like a bat out of hell after hitting the fucking ground that's made of stone okay i don't know what the fuck just happened here Agatha turns into some black magic creature, like she's Credence from the Fantastic Beasts movies, flying around like some CG apparition. Sol, being a competent Jedi Master, gets scared and stabs her, killing her on the spot. Before she dies, with the lightsaber still sticking in her, she is able to utter a couple sentences very clearly. I was only trying to help my daughter, you stupid fucking idiot the power of one the power of two the power of many dun 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 boom 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 good night sweet princess it's been a long day without you my friend Here's a pro tip for further witches that decide to turn into scary smoke monsters from Lost. Maybe before doing so, you explain what you're about to do to the person that may or may not stab you in the face with a magical sword. Maybe say, hey, I'm about to do something pretty crazy, but I don't mean you any harm. Just helping my daughter out. I'm releasing her from her whatever enchanted spell or something. Be cool. Be calm. Jedi on. Lady Maul springs into action, furious about what happened. Run! Belting out this horrifically strong, powerful primal scream that would make even the horniest man flaccid. She turns to Ash as well and enters the body of old man Chewbacca. It's a 1v2 with budget Chewbacca kicking the shit out of Soul and the little Padawan kid. Until Master Squid Game yells, Trinity, help! And just like that, she springs into action. Force pulling that shit out of the hairy beast. All these witches in the corner that are doing this chant to keep the, I guess, magic intact. All the girls at the party, look in that body, shaking that thing like you never did see. Got a nice package, all right. Guess I'm gonna have to party too. And they all, I guess, climax at the same time and pass out. Soul takes off to save the twins ends up right in the midst of a trolley problem. Two girls, one bridge. The thing is broken in the middle, it's about to collapse, and unfortunately, he only has enough force in the tank stored up to hold one of them afloat. This is essentially the ending of The Good Son with Macaulay Culkin. Do you remember, you remember that chestnut? 
It's the same. It's the same thing. And he does the same thing. He saves the good girl, letting May drop to her supposed death. But she does end up living. We, we find that out. 16 years later, we find that out. Osha, as she always does in this show, wakes up from a bad nightmare. And these Jedi don't even have a goddamn juice box for her? Come on! She asks them what happened. Squid Games tells the truth. He said May started a fire, and that's how it ends. I don't know if that was supposed to be this big aha moment, like he lied to her. He didn't lie to her. May did start a fire. Obviously, he's keeping from her that he's the one that couldn't save her because he could only pick up one, and he really did nothing wrong. I don't, I don't know what he was supposed to do here. I guess get good, be stronger with the Force. This episode, just like all Star Wars shows and movies, ends with a pop song. It has a little bit of a rap flow to it. I didn't mind it. I listened to the whole song because I was still taking notes on the, the this amazing episode. And it, it struck me that this was actually a song created for the show. Because at one point, there's background singers saying, The Power of Two. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. The Power of Two. Yeah. Uh. Uh. Yeah. The Power of Many. Uh. Yeah. And the female that's singing, it's like, These girls were alone and they had force on their side and then the Jedi will ride and then the Jedi will ride and The power of two. <laughs> I'm just making this. Is not, <laughs> the song's nothing like that. <laughs> but it's awesome. Wow, we, wow, we, wow. What an incredible time that was. I felt like I learned so much about the Crapolite. And you know what? The leadership over there at Disney Star Wars really deserves a huge thank you. Thank you, Disney Star Wars, and a massive round of applause. Thank you, Disney. I love what you've done with my heroes. It is with a heavy heart that I have to end this on kind of a Sour Patch note. For the finale, I will actually be out of town, so I will not be in studio to give you the recrap the way you've been expecting it. But that doesn't mean I'm not going to do one. No, we, we got to get all the we got to get all the revenue out of this craptastic show we can, folks. Uh, it's, it's it's the lifeblood of the channel right now. So I will watch it next Tuesday night. I will write my, my notes, and I will film it. I will just not be in the studio. I'll be somewhere else, okay? So don't worry. It's going to happen. It's just going to be different. But I'm going to do my best to entertain all the same. All right, thank you for watching the video. Make sure to subscribe and like this video if you haven't already. Maybe you're new here and this is all brand new, fresh material, in which case I would love to have you stick around. I post movie content mostly every single week. TV shows are a bonus if I feel like I can make a lot of money from them. Please like the video, support the channel by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash adamdoesmovies. And I have a second channel that I fired up a couple months back called Adam Does Rants. That's all about ranting about top of the line, really crucial, serious first world problems people have, like having to wait in line for Starbucks or listening to people talking on their phone loudly in public or your neighbor not mowing his lawn, things like that. Really, really top shelf issues, really kitchen table topics. All right. May the force at some point come to an end. I'll see you next time.